So kia ora everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for this uh, Space Entrepreneurship from the Edge of the World webinar. I'm Emmeline Pat Dahlstrom. And I'm Eric Dahlstrom. And uh, we are Edmund Hillary Fellows and co-founders of Space Base, a social enterprise focused on catalyzing the space uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem in New Zealand. Uh, we delivered the New Zealand Space and Aerospace Challenge for the past two years. We also teach, mentor, and consult on space-related initiatives globally. Uh, this webinar kind of like came about uh, because over the past three years, we've seen the growth of the uh, industry in the New Zealand Space Agency's activities and initiatives, uh, especially the global success of Rocket Lab uh, and the increasing interest of all, all over New Zealand of individuals and organizations to get involved um, currently in this often risky but highly lucrative industry. Uh, the recent Deloitte report listed the 1.7 billion as the current contribution of the industry to the national economy. Uh, while predictions globally put the industry at over a trillion dollars by 2040. So there's a lot of opportunity here, uh, which we hope to address in this session with the experts and players of the industry in New Zealand. Uh, we hope we can incentivize uh, Kiwi entrepreneurs out there who are curious about the industry or wondering how to start their own uh, space uh, company. So one thing to note, uh, we are actually recording uh, this webinar so that we can share it later on. Uh, and then for the agenda for today, we have four speakers and uh, I will be introducing the, the speakers one at a time uh, before their presentation, but just to note that uh, our topics are essentially kind of the, the space environment in New Zealand and what are the opportunities. Uh, then we'll get some lessons learned and insights from uh, seasoned space entrepreneurs. Uh, and then uh, understanding how you can raise capital and what investors are looking for uh, for, for this uh, space uh, startups and businesses. And then lastly, uh, sources of funding as well from, from the government. I uh, wanted to note that uh, we, uh, just to acknowledge Innovation uh, Queenstown, which is doing a separate uh, event to actually listen to us today. So uh, yeah, thanks for, for, for doing that, AJ Mason. So again, uh, let's start uh, with, with the program. And our first speaker today is uh, Virginia Fenton. Uh, Virginia Fenton is a principal policy advisor at the New Zealand Space Agency, uh, part of the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Virginia has previously held policy positions at the UK Treasury and the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, she has the Master's in International Relations from Science uh, Po Paris and uh, studied European languages as, at Otago University. Uh, so. Uh, and, and pardon me, Virginia, but uh, we should just mention that uh, people who have questions should uh, enter them into the Q and A uh, panel on the uh, within the webinar at the bottom of the screen. Correct. And we will be collating those questions. We'll have about two to three uh, questions that we'll ask after each of the uh, the talks. But then we'll have a general Q and A uh, afterwards at the end of the program. Great. So I'll uh, Virginia take it over. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you today about space activities in New Zealand. <clears throat> I'll start by giving you a brief overview of the role of the New Zealand Space Agency, um, then talk a bit about the definition of the space sector, um, so what activities are part of the space sector, um, then take you through the different subsectors and talk about some examples of activities operating in each one, um, and then describe the space sector's contribution to the New Zealand economy. So the Space Agency was set up in 2016 when Rocket Lab announced its intention to start launching from New Zealand. Um, so we realised we needed laws and regulations to ensure the safe use of space and an agency to regulate them. Yeah, so New Zealand um, is very much... Uh, one, one second, uh, Virginia. Um, yeah. you're, we don't see your screen sharing yet. Okay. Sorry. Wait a minute. I'll just try that again. Yes. Yep, now, better? Yes. Okay. 
Right, sorry about that. There wasn't much on the first slide, so you haven't missed anything. <laughs> okay, so, um, so New Zealand's very much a new space nation and our space sector is driven by commercial activity rather than large government investments in space, as is the case in more traditional space nations. Um, so the Space Agency in New Zealand has responsibility in three main areas. And we're responsible for um, regulating the use of space um, in high altitude activities, developing policy um, to ensure the safe and responsible use of space and to develop a um, <clears throat> thriving industry and research community. And um, we enable space related science, business and innovation. We also engage with um, business in businesses internationally and other governments and with the New Zealand public. So last year, um, to help us get a clearer picture of what's out there on the ground in the New Zealand space sector, we commissioned a report from Deloitte. Um, the report was published um, in November and it does a few things. It defines what's in the space sector in New Zealand, so we know what we're measuring. Um, it describes the space value chain in New Zealand on the basis of a survey and some desk research. And it values the contribution that the space sector makes to the New Zealand economy. So you can see from this diagram, um, that the space sector um, includes both the space supply, supply, chain, supply chain base, which is those um, bits in the blue, dark blue circle in the middle. So space manufacturing, space operations, ancillary services and research and development. Um, uh, as well sorry as again, Virginia, uh, I think your slides is not advancing. So I think you need to advance the slides. Okay. Uh, what are you seeing? Um, we have the New Zealand Space Agency regulation, space policy, and sector policy. Okay. Mm, that's strange because um, I am advancing them. Can I just try sharing again? Would that be all right? Sure. Sorry. Yep. Okay, is that better? Yes, we're now in the definition of the space sector. Okay, great. Right, so yeah, this is the diagram here. So you've got the um, space supply chain base in the middle in the dark blue circle, space applications on the outside, um, the little blue circle, and then more broadly, you've got the, the wider space economy. So that includes non-direct beneficiaries and ancillary users. And in our study, we didn't measure those because it's just really too broad to measure. Um, so all of these elements are present in space sectors internationally um, in one form or another. And the definition we used, um, we pretty much um, use the same definition as the UK and Australia um, in recent studies that they've done on their space sectors. Um, and that was very much influenced by the OECD methodology on measuring the space sector. So um, all of those factors mean that we can easily compare our space sector with other space sectors internationally. So I'll just go through a bit more detail on what the individual um, subsectors include and hopefully you can now see my next slide yes great okay so <clears throat> space manufacturing is a design and manufacture of space equipment and subsystems for launch activities satellites and ground stations um, so examples in new zealand you can see in the bottom right photo there that's rocket labs um, production facility so Rocket Lab's the world's only um, commercial dedicated small satellite launcher, as you'll no doubt know. And um, yeah, it's factory in um, Auckland is specifically made for the production of the Electron rocket. Um, Dawn Aerospace, that's its logo there, um, is a company based in Christchurch and the Netherlands. Um, and de they've developed an environmentally friendly small satellite propulsion system. Um, and they're working on a horizontal small satellite launcher. Xeno Astronautics, that's their logo there. Um, it's based in Auckland and they're developing a propulsion system for small satellites and associated software. So a fair bit going on in space manufacturing in New Zealand. Um, space operations, can you see that slide? Yes. Yep, great. Um, includes launch satellite and ground station operations. Um, and there's quite a bit of activity in this area in New Zealand, um, which reflects our unique geography. So we've got clear skies and seas, um, a wide range of launch angles, which allows access to a wide range of orbits. Um, good location for ground stations, a great business environment and a forward thinking, flexible regulatory regime. And so that's drawn um, Rocket Lab to start with um, to launch here. So you can see Launch Complex 1 there on the Mahia Peninsula. And they've launched um, 48 satellites now um, through 11 successful launches. Um, and below that, you can see a picture of the Kiwi Space Radar. Um, so that's a phased array radar that Leo Labs um, opened in Naseby last year. And I think Daniel's going to talk a bit more about that um, shortly. 
And then on the left is a picture of the Aorua ground, um, Aorua satellite ground station um, in Southland. Um, and that's run by Great South, um, the Southland Regional Development Agency, one of our longest standing space companies. Um, and it serves a range of customers, including the European Space Agency, NASA, um, and the Japanese Space Agency. Uh, and then we've got space applications, um, which includes applications making use of satellite signals and data, like satellite TV, um, GPS vehicle tracking, things like that. Um, and this is an area with a lot of potential for New Zealand, um, because we've got lots of unique challenges with a large land and sea area um, and not many people. Um, so there's almost unlimited um, use cases and opportunities for space-based data. And part of the challenge is um, encouraging user uptake. Um, and there are a couple of companies, um, a couple of examples there, Orbica and Sequent, that are both based in Christchurch. And they're increasingly making space-based data available to companies in New Zealand um, by taking the raw data and then visualizing and mapping it for industries like transport, mining, civil engineering. Um, and then finally, we've got ancillary services, which are specialized support services and R&D. And the report said that we had um, cutting edge research and development capability in universities across the country. Um, so all of these um, subsectors generate significant revenue. Um, so you can see here on this slide, space sector revenue in 2018 to 19 was um, $1.75 billion. Um, so the space sector in New Zealand is dominated by space applications. There it is at just over a billion dollars. That's 57% of the um, space sector, followed by space manufacturing at 247 million, that's 15%, and then space operations at 150 million, which is 9%. Um, so you can see the figures represented in pie chart form at the bottom of the screen. Um, that enables a little comparison with the UK space sector, um, which is on the right. Um, so you can see there that um, it's a kind of similar structure, really. So the UK sector is also dominated by space applications at 69%. Um, space manufacturing is exactly the same at 13% and space operations are similar at 15% versus our 9%. So the revenue um, figures are useful to show the size of the sector. Um, it also allows us to break it down into subsectors and get an idea of which ones are um, strengths for New Zealand. Um, and it also allows for international comparisons. So um, here you can see where we sit um, compared to a few different space economy, space sectors. Um, so for, first in relation to Australia, which in 2016 had um, revenue of a maximum of 4.5 billion. So they were about 40% of their space revenue, um, even though we're only 20% of Australia's population and 15% of their GDP. So we're doing pretty well um, in comparison. Um, Queensland had space revenue um, in 2018 to 19 of $0.8 billion. So we're roughly double that revenue um, with a similar population and GDP. And then if you look at the UK, um, we're about 7% of their space revenue, 7% uh, of their population and about the same of their GDP. So we're really holding our own there as well. Um, so the revenue figure um, is useful, but it doesn't actually tell us what the impact of the space sector is on the New Zealand economy. So that's where this um, economic contribution or value added figure comes in. And that figure for 2018 to 19, according to the Deloitte report, was $1.69 billion. Um, and that measures the space sector's contribution um, to the New Zealand economy um, through wages and profits. Um, so that's the direct value added. And then from wages and profits further down the supply chain. And that's indirect value added. Um, for context, um, the total economic contribution of the space sector is about 8% of the total economic contribution of the dairy sector. Um, and then on employment, the sector supports about 12,000 jobs, um, 5,000 directly and 7,000 in other sectors that provide services to the space sector. So this detailed picture that we've got from the report of the New Zealand space sector um, is going to be really useful in our ongoing efforts to encourage um, science um, and innovation in the space sector in New Zealand and also help us measure the growth of the space sector in the future. And that's it. Any questions? Great. Thanks so much, uh, Virginia. Let's see if there's uh, so there's I don't see any questions at the moment, but um, well, I Oh, Eric, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to unmute. So you mentioned uh, third party uh, ground segment uh, operations. Is that, do you, did that, uh, is that what you meant by with the ESA and NASA uh, and Japanese ground segment? To so there I was referring to the Aurora ground station in Southland where those space agencies are customers 
of the Arrow Road ground station. Yeah. Yeah, I see. And um, oh, here's here's a couple of questions um, that. Uh, uh, let's see. There's um, one. Well, one question is. Um, uh, I guess from a government perspective, are there provisions for protecting dark skies um, with the, uh, um, it's a, it's an increasing international issue um, about the large constellations, but it's, but it, it's, it's not necessarily something that's launched from, from New Zealand, but. Uh, um, yeah, even though we don't, um, you know, we're not launching those constellations ourselves, we're very much conscious of the need to be a responsible space actor. And so we're actively thinking about um, our policy position on that issue and lots of other um, sort of international space, space issues that, um, you know, that we're not directly involved, where we're not directly involved in launch. Um, yeah, and I think top of mind for that is the need to, um, to be a responsible and sustainable user of space. So yeah, that's very much on our minds. We don't have a position on it yet, but watch the space. And one general question about uh, supporting sort of uh, the development of, of the uh, marketing or and the manufacturing segment uh, of this of space is there a uh, is there a move towards uh, sort of coordinated uh, testing facilities uh, you know for for space uh, development you know the thermal and vibration and uh, infrastructure and things like that um, it's uh, uh, I, I guess there. I guess there's a, a reference from Sam Tobin that uh, the UK has some kind of program that that supports in that way. Um, I'm not sure of the detail on testing facilities, but I can find out from colleagues actually and get back to you. That would be helpful. Yeah, I think uh, that would be interesting. Um, yeah, I know okay. that there's a, in Christchurch. There's a, a team task force to to identify testing facilities in the in the area. Maybe one last question. Um, yeah, is there's um, uh, about uh, there's a question about you. You have this uh, snapshot of the uh, ec current economic uh, value of, uh, of the industry for New Zealand, but is are there any projections or targets for uh, future growth that are are particular uh, specific? So the, ta the, um, the aim with this report was simply, as you say, to get a snapshot um, and establish what's out there as a first step. Um, so um, in such a fast moving industry, it's quite difficult, as you can imagine, to make predictions. And so that would need to be a fairly significant piece of work. And if we did it, yeah, it would very much be the next step. So um, yeah, but certainly this um, report will, will be a baseline, which will enable us to measure growth going forward um, on a sort of we think maybe every two to five years, we'd want to do something similar again to see how things are going. Great, thank you so much, uh, Virginia. So our next speaker is uh, Daniel Sepperly. Uh, he's the CEO of Leo Labs. Uh, Dan earned a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley. Uh, with a thesis on computer simulation of advanced optical systems. Uh, as program director of SRI, International, he led a team of 20 plus engineers and scientists and developed SRI's commercial satellite tracking business. Uh, Leo Labs recently built a radar tracking station in the South Island to monitor satellites and debris, as uh, Virginia talked about earlier. So, uh, welcome, uh, Daniel. Thank you very much. I, I really want to say a special thank you for extending the offer to participate. It's a pleasure to speak with everyone today. So, uh, my name is Dan Sepperly. I'm the CEO and a member of the founding team of Leo Labs. And I was asked today to talk a little bit about being an entrepreneur in the space industry. Uh, and so I am going to kind of divide my remarks up into three sections. I'll start by talking a bit about Leo Labs, why we're in the market, what we do. Uh, then I'll go into kind of our backstory. So how we started the company, our journey as entrepreneurs, and throw a couple suggestions in there for anybody who might be starting their own company, raising funds for their own company. Uh, and then I'll end with a comment on a, a change that's sweeping the space industry that uh, hopefully will be of uh, help to anybody who's looking to get into space startups. So, let's see. All right, did my second slide come through? Yes, it did. Perfect. 
So Leo Labs is in business because there is a big business revolution going on in the space industry. And in particular, it's happening in low Earth orbit. There are hundreds, maybe even thousands of new companies around the globe that are using space to deliver innovative new services down here on Earth. So it's things like mega constellations providing broadband to internet access around the world or internet of things communications connecting sensors on farms and shipping containers and weather monitors all around the globe. Uh, it's responsive imaging services powering uh, people watching for climate change or disaster response or construction monitoring. There's many new applications. And they're primarily launched because there's a new generation of venture investment in the space industry, and also because the cost of accessing space is lower. So the cost of, of building and launching satellites is lower. Um, a few years ago, maybe four years ago, there were about 400 active satellites in low Earth orbit. That number is over 1,500 today. I think it's closer to 1,700. And on this slide, you can actually see a snapshot of the last 24 hours in low Earth orbit. Uh, this is something that we have open on our website for people to take a look at. And you can even see some of the, uh, the very new activity in the lower right corner of this image is a streak of satellites. These are one of the latest Starlink or SpaceX launches. And it's a batch of about 50 or 60 satellites, I should say, that are gonna be spread out into a ring around the Earth. So now in addition to all of this new activity, all of these new satellites, there also are a number of ancillary industries that have cropped up. Um, new rocket and launch opportunities, uh, networks of teleports that help download data, and services like Leo Labs to track a lot of these satellites. These uh, services have sprung up to help make space easier to access and easier to use, and they really lock in a lot of the gains that we've seen uh, in the space industry. Now, on top of all of this new traffic, there's also already a lot of man-made debris in space. So on this image here, actually, uh, so I said there's about 1,500 functional satellites. Well, there's about 12,000 pieces of man-made debris. These are dead satellites, dead rocket bodies, and fragments of satellites and rocket bodies created by explosions and collisions and the like. All of these pose extreme risks to satellites and astronauts that are, that are in space. And it drives an urgent need for better information about the risks in space. And that's where Leo Labs comes in. So we are the commercial platform for space traffic safety in low Earth orbit. And there's really two pieces to our technology. One is a set of radars located on the ground, and the other is a set of software located in the cloud. Uh, on this picture, on this slide, you see a picture of our latest radar. Uh, we were very proud to announce last year the Kiwi Space Radar, the third radar in our network. It's also the first radar of its type in the Southern Hemisphere. It turns out no space agency anywhere has a phased array radar in the Southern Hemisphere, and that actually means collision prevention is not as good in the Southern Hemisphere. So with uh, KSR, uh, we see, sought to address this issue, and I'm happy to say uh, we're delivering services to customers today. So a little bit about this radar. Uh, we're delivering on a new technology and a new business model in the space industry. We actually built this radar in less than a year. That's less than a year to go from breaking ground to delivering data, and that's a big milestone. Normally, a project like this built by a large government organization would take a decade. That's a decade to go from breaking ground to delivering data. And that's simply not fast enough to keep up with all the new satellite activities in space. So you'll hear me talk a lot about radars and we focus on radar technology because it is the best means of tracking satellites in low earth orbit. Radar can operate around the clock. It's not affected by sunlight and it's not affected by weather. So it can see through clouds, it can see through rain, it can see through snow. We use a special type of radars called phased array radars. That means there are no moving parts and instead it's electronically steered. So every millisecond we're able to switch from checking a satellite over to the east to another satellite to the west to a piece of debris directly overhead. And this is critical because there are thousands of satellites and pieces of debris passing over our radars every hour. And we need to keep up with all of that. Now, 
Unfortunately, one radar is simply not enough. If you've got only one radar, it turns out you can only check on a satellite or a piece of debris about twice per day. So you go for 12 hours without being able to, to collect more information. So we're in the process of building out a global network of these radars. Uh, we have three in operation today, uh, one in the northern US, one in the southern US, uh, and one in New Zealand. And we'll be building three more of these over the next uh, two years. Uh, and from the network that we already have today, we're delivering a lot of information to our subscribers. So we're delivering over half a million measurements. We're updating the orbits on satellites in debris over 13,000 times per day. We're delivering over 800,000 alerts about potential collisions in space to our subscribers. And for high priority satellites, such as newly launched satellites, we're able to track them up to six times per day. And all of these are services that are critical for making sure this new revolution in the space industry is sustainable. Um, on top of that, the new radars in our network, starting with the Kiwi Space Radar, are gonna be tracking small debris, debris as small as two centimeters across, and we expect to be tracking 250,000 pieces of it by the time the network's done. This actually represents 95% of the collision risk, and it's not tracked today, so we're looking to solve that. So, um, so we're generating all this data, all this information. What do we do with it? Well, one of the most important things we do is we report on risks. And I already mentioned collisions, but I'm going to go into a little more information uh, about collisions uh, and really highlight the fact that there's a set of collision risk that is highly underreported. And that's actually the risk of two derelict satellites colliding with each other. It turns out before LEO Labs, there's nobody who is watching for potential collisions between dead satellites or between pieces of debris. And since most of the stuff in space are dead satellites or debris, uh, this sort of collision risk is actually quite high. And it's quite important to get this information into people's hands so that they can make new policies or update the rules of the road to make sure the new space revolution is sustainable. And in particular, we've started publicly highlighting some of the close approaches, the near misses that happen, uh, so that people can get a better idea of the risks. This is actually a snapshot on this slide of some of the data that we publicly released at the end of January about a near miss uh, that occurred uh, over a city in the US called Pittsburgh. Uh, this was between two dead NASA satellites. Turns out one was launched in 1967 and one was launched in 1983. And decades ago, they finished their missions, but they're still in space and they're gonna be there for centuries. So at the end of January, these two satellites passed within less than 50 meters of one another, and they were traveling very fast, um, close to 15 kilometers per second. Uh, these were large enough and they were moving fast enough that if they'd actually hit, they would have created thousands of new pieces of debris that would have threatened satellites and space operators for decades and centuries to come. Uh, at the moment, unfortunately, there's actually nothing we can do about this. And when it comes to space debris, there's generally kind of three things you can do. Um, one is you can make sure you don't create it. So that is uh, undertaking things like making sure your satellites don't have pieces that come off or your rockets don't leave extra things in space. Uh, you can remove debris, and that involves at the end of a mission, making sure your satellite goes back into the atmosphere to burn up. Or hopefully in the future, there will be an active debris removal industry that can go grab your satellite and tow it back into the atmosphere. And then finally, you have to dodge the space debris. And that's where we LEO labs can help. But unfortunately, when it comes to two dead satellites, uh, there is literally nothing we can do at the moment. So we put this information out uh, with the notion that it needed to get into the public discussion. And um, we were quite pleased uh, about the amount of press that it got. And you can see a snapshot of one of the articles on the right. It was picked up in news venues like Forbes and TechCrunch and BBC Radio and Space News and generated a lot of discussion around uh, both excitement for the new space industry and also a desire to really make sure um, this new revolution is sustainable. And I should point out um, on the left side here, we've got some of the reporting uh, that we put out on this particular conjunction. In the upper left, uh, you see some of the basic statistics about the near miss the missed distance, the probability of collision, the closing speed. Uh, in the bottom, you actually see a snapshot from a movie that we put online 
which shows the two satellites whizzing past one another. The orange ellipse shows the approximate position of one of the satellites. The green ellipse shows the approximate position of the other. And the red and green, or the orange and green lines, show the two trajectories that the satellites were moving on as they passed one another. The red area is the region where, if a collision were to happen, it's the most likely spot uh, for that collision. So, um, so that's a big part of what we do, is making sure that risk information is in the right people's hands so that hopefully they can do something about it, or in the case of derelict satellites, make plans to do something about it in the future. So I'm going to step aside a little bit from talking about what we do at Leo Labs and changes in the industry and talk a little bit more about our founding story and uh, our journey as entrepreneurs and raising funding and with the hope that uh, that will help anybody who's contemplating starting their own business or, or may have already started their own business uh, in the space industry. And I should note that some of these slides I'm showing, we actually use in our fundraising pitches. So hopefully you're getting a flavor of some of the information and the, the story that was successful for us. And actually this slide right here is an important one for us. Uh, we don't put the, uh, the first bullet on here during uh, our normal pitches, but the others do appear here. So um, if you followed our news stories, we've announced that we've raised $17 million uh, US uh, to date, and that was split between a Series Seed and a Series A fundraising round. Um, we are a Silicon Valley startup. We are, our headquarters is located in Silicon Valley, uh, very close to San Francisco. And, uh, you know, as, as part of being a Silicon Valley startup, we're also venture backed. So our company operations are financed by venture capital uh, that we've raised from professional investors. Um, and for someone who's been in the space industry for a while, this new wave of venture investment is quite exciting because it enables us to move very quickly and be masters of our own destiny. We can build what we think needs to be built and go out and test it in the market to see if people will use it. Um, I myself spent about eight years at a large research lab working on government projects and projects funded by large government agencies and uh, you know, executed by large organizations move at a much slower pace. So it's a lot of fun being in the space industry um, fueled by venture investment. Um, however, venture investment carries its um, own set of challenges, I should say. Uh, you actually have to spend a lot of time going out and raising the money. That means convincing investors uh, to put money into your company. Uh, when I think back on our past experience, on our two rounds, it probably took us about nine months in each case to go from developing the pitch to connecting with investors, to delivering the pitch pitches, to ultimately finding the interested investors, going through due diligence with lawyers, and finally getting the money in our bank account. So if you need to raise money, I encourage you to uh, start early because it uh, can be quite a lengthy process. Um, another challenge when uh, raising venture capital for a company is you really have to get used to rejection. So when I was raising a funding, I gave the Leo Labs pitch easily over a hundred times. And almost every single time we gave the pitch, we got a no. Most of the investors said no. Or we often got kind of ambiguous answers, which were people who never quite got done asking questions, were always a little bit skeptical, and we could never quite convince them. So I would say just keep in mind, you only need one yes to ultimately get the money to, uh, to really start the company. So just keep going. Um, one other piece of advice is when you're looking for investors, focus all of your energy on finding the lead investor. The lead investor is the first one to put money into the company. They're also the ones that do a very deep dive into your company, analyzing your contracts and who you hired and your plans. And, and ultimately going through those with their lawyers. And they're also the ones that negotiate the price, your share price, uh, that ultimately dictates uh, how much of the company you need to sell to raise the money. You'll find there's a lot of investors who will promise to, to give you money if only you find that lead investor. And so uh, focus very much on, on that lead investment. Um, two other bullet points on this slide are quite important. One is we were spun out of SRI International. And the second is we're founded on over 20 years of research and development. So SRI International is a research lab in the San Francisco area. They're very well known for launching spin-outs, the most famous of which is probably Siri. 
the assistant on your iPhone. Uh, and, but they've launched many others over the, the course of the years. And we are the first uh, and only space spin out so far. I highlight these two things because VCs, a lot of VCs really like software only startups. And uh, being in the space industry, you're probably not building a company that's only software. You probably got a lot of hardware. So it's worth looking for VCs that advertise their interest in deep tech or hard tech or hardware, uh, because they will be predisposed to uh, enjoy working with companies like your own. Um, and I also want to uh, emphasize that having come out of a research lab uh, was very good for giving us strong credentials in the technology. And also we were backed early on by Airbus Ventures and having the Airbus name behind us gave a lot of uh, other investors the confidence that our technology had been validated by a respected aerospace firm. So, uh, and one final piece I would say is, um, you gotta remember to brag about your companies. So myself and all the other co-founders of our company, we're pretty humble people. We're engineers who just like to get the job done. But when you're in front of investors, you have very little time. So you have to take the exciting parts of your company, bring them to the front, and just really tell the investor what's awesome about the company. And also the investor is extremely busy. So they are not going to take the time to dig through your business and find those interesting tidbits. You've got to bring them to the front and center. Um, another piece, uh, important element when raising fundraising or raising funding is to talk about your team. Uh, quite often investors are looking for the team even more than the business model or the technology. And so with us, we made sure to highlight that our team has a very broad technical background, a lot of experience in different parts of the industry, uh, and also that we've got a diverse set of skills. So there's certainly a lot of engineers, um, but we also very early on brought on some really top-notch business development assistants. And we also got an important advisor, somebody who had done this before. In the lower right corner of this slide, you see Tom Ingersoll, who was the CEO of Skybox at the time that company was acquired by Google. And he also successfully ran uh, other companies as well. So seeing that you've got a broad team that can really execute on your vision is critical. Um, I would also encourage anybody who's launching a business to bring on a few additional advisors. We have a few other advisors who aren't shown here and they can be really critical in the early days um, for doing things like reviewing your pitch and giving you feedback before you go in front of investors to introducing you to investors and those sorts of personal introductions carry a lot of weight. And finally, pointers on how to run a business, especially if you're a first time CEO, um, introductions to attorneys and uh, discussions about how you hire and how you grow a team are quite critical. So, um, in the tiny bit of time I have remaining, I want to shift gears one final time and talk about a change that's going through the space industry that hopefully will inform anybody out there uh, who is thinking about launching a space business. And that in particular is the rise of the platform business model in the space industry. And I mean something very particular by platforms. And that is a set of three things or a system that's got three elements to it. One is a utility or essentially a technology. Second is a set of procedures and personnel that make it easy to use the technology. And the third is an ecosystem of users that are building applications and carrying this technology into what they do. And I bring up this platform technology to say that it's new to the space industry. Uh, it is not new to other industries. It's been in the computing industry for decades and used quite successfully. So if you've been in the computing industry, you might consider taking some of your know-how over to the space industry. Um, on this slide, I've captured some of the uh, technological platforms that have swept through the uh, computing industry over the last few decades. They've been used to create trillions of dollars of value. Just to highlight a few, on the far left in the 1980s, you have the personal computers. This was definitely a set of technology enabling people to do computing on their uh, desktop. Um, but it was also a set of procedures and a set of personnel that would help you set up the personal computer, troubleshoot it, um, and get a lot of value out of it. And then there were a set of software developers who were writing applications that made, carried the personal computer into different industries. So it was definitely a platform. Later on in the 90s, these uh, personal computers were networked that ultimately led to the internet, which was its own platform. And eventually those computers were shrunk down to smartphones. You add cellular service and you have the smartphone platform. Uh, and then finally, 
Lately, you may have seen in the news, there's a number of new platforms going through the venture industry. There's a bunch of bets being made, and it's unclear who the winners are going to be, but we'll probably know in the next few years. Uh, but these are platforms in areas like artificial intelligence, blockchain, quantum computing, and, and space. And in particular in space, I want to highlight uh, a few of the companies that I argue are actually platforms, one of which you'll be very familiar with, which is Rocket Lab. Uh, Rocket Lab, at first glance, looks like a company building small rockets. But if you think a little bit more about it, they're actually a platform. They've got people who will get your satellite safely on the rocket and get it into space where it needs to go. Uh, and they've got customers who are building satellite constellations based around this launch capability. So they're carrying this launch capability into different parts of the industry. Planet is a satellite company in San Francisco flying a large fleet of satellites. Again, at first glance, it looks like they're only a satellite technology company, but actually a huge part of their business is making the data those satellites generate easy to use and getting that plugged into different application developers who carry it over into completely different industries. Um, of course, in the lower right, Amazon has its cloud computing platform, which powers a huge amount of the web today and a lot of startups. And they've extended that with their ground station network or the ability to download satellite data directly into their platform. So it's a platform that's moving horizontally into the space industry. And then of course at Leo Labs, we present ourselves as a platform. We have a set of radars, first glance we're a radar company, but actually most of our employees are focused on making that radar data easy to use and getting it connected into different industries. So with that, uh, I'd just like to thank you for your time. It's a very interesting time to be part of the space industry. There's a big revolution going on. At Leo Labs, we are making sure that revolution is successful and sustainable. And I hope I've been provided some interesting information that help any entrepreneurs out there looking to get into the space industry to get a little more easily through some of the hurdles that we faced in our early days. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan, for, for all that in, uh you know, rich insight and, and experience. So I think we have uh, probably maybe... Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, I wondered if you were... Uh, I saw a news story that Leo Labs and the New Zealand government had an agreement, uh, uh, I think, for perhaps for extra tracking of things launched from New Zealand or, or something like that. And Yes. Actually, that's a really interesting uh, topic to dive into. I'll just go very quick, though, in the interest of time. The um, yeah, uh, middle of last year, the New Zealand Space Agency and Leo Labs announced a partnership for the Space Sustainability and Regulatory Platform, and that uses the Leo Labs radar network to uh, collect data in real time uh, on all of the satellites that are launched from New Zealand, and it enables the New Zealand Space Agency to have information about uh, the satellites that they've licensed and that are launched. And it's really critical because it actually puts the New Zealand Space Agency in an incredible leadership position. They're the only regulator around the world that is using real-time data to make database decisions about their policies and the future of the space industry. It turns out that all the other regulators focus entirely on pre-launch licensing activities, uh, you know, making sure the plans are good, making sure satellite operators are gonna prevent debris, uh, but there's not much follow-up once the satellites reach space. And there's a huge amount of concern. There's a lot of people talking about how do we update the rules of the road? How do we make sure all of these new, exciting technical developments are successful, but also sustainable? And, uh, and there's um, people looking around for who is going to lead that discussion globally. And I think the uh, New Zealand Space Agency's in, in the leadership position there. So I look forward to uh, what's going to happen over the next few years. Emily. Okay. Um, yeah. So we have. Um, yeah. Just a short time for questions. Let's see. Uh, there's uh, on the. Uh, there's a question from Sam Tobin. Um, what kind of scale of investments are are deep tech uh, VCs looking for? Uh, it's like uh, th there's there's this challenge with New Zealand startups of of uh, sort of like there's a certain level of investment, but then the if you really wanted to to go to a, a large uh, manufacturing capability, it, it may uh, may reach reach the threshold of New Zealand uh, investors. So it's mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I'd say uh, I'd encourage you to um, certainly talk to New Zealand investors, um, but also talk a little more globally. And, uh, you know, if you have some good New Zealand investors, encourage them to reach into their network and connect you globally, because um, increasingly the venture capital world, it's a, it's, a, it's a global network, it's a global environment. And especially the space investment world is, is also quite global. So, you know, if the business model sound, if you can show that for the investment amount you're talking about, there will be a very interesting business, a very successful business. Um, I think you, you will find investment uh, outside of New Zealand and, and be able to raise it. It, um, uh, it will involve some travel because ultimately face-to-face uh, -face pitches are, are usually the most effective. But, uh, you know, there's a growing number of uh, uh, new space conferences where there's, there are some investors present and it's kind of a good entry point uh, to get connected into that, uh, that, global, that global network. Awesome. I think in the interest of time, uh, we're going to move on to the next speaker. I know that there's other questions online and maybe Dan can also answer them uh, on written form and or we'll get back to them uh, in a little bit later in the general Q&A. So let's go Thank to you. our next speaker. Thanks, thanks again. Our next speaker is, uh, is John Sandbrook uh, from... He's an investment manager from WMT Ventures. Uh, John has a broad background as a founder, corporate strategist, business developer, consultant, uh, and executive focusing on building and growing companies, primarily in the agriculture, food, biotechnology, and technology sectors. Uh, John spent a number of years based in the U.S. in roles in small business investment and specialist bi biotechnology consulting as well as founding and developing an animal health vaccine and diagnostic startup from inception to exit. Uh, John has previously held senior executive roles in public policy and corporate strategy. Uh, in his role as investment manager at WNT Ventures, John leads new investment opportunity sourcing, as well as working closely alongside founders and CEOs of several of WNT's existing portfolio and companies. Uh, Jen has a passion for encouraging systemic innovation, cutting edge startups and global reach and founders with a vision to change the world, as well as social ventures with the potential to address some of the world's biggest challenges. Uh, welcome, John. Thanks, Emily. And look, I know that's, that's a bit of a mouthful. I think um, you know, probably more than, more than everyone needed to know about me, to be fair. But yeah. um, look, really appreciate the opportunity to participate today. I think it's a a fascinating uh, combination of speakers and views around a really uh, emerging sector for New Zealand. I think it's really exciting. So really pleased to be here. Um, and I'm going to naturally follow on from what uh, Virginia and Dan have said and um, and touch on a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, but you know, would, would welcome uh, questions as well. So I'm going to try and see if I can share a screen here, and hopefully the technology works. And you see that okay? Yep. Um, if you can just uh, put it on a uh, slideshow. There we go. Yep. There we go. So hopefully we can uh, deal with the technology here, but just let me know, give me a, a shout if it's not showing up. Um, look, so uh, as Emily pointed out, um, I'm an investment manager with WNT Ventures. Uh, we are a, a New Zealand based deep tech investor. Um, one of those uh, good or bad, not sure uh, how Dan would view it in terms of the venture capitalists, but uh, you know, definitely a player in the deep tech ecosystem in New Zealand um, and have done for some time. Um, we're also a technology incubator and we wear that moniker um, in part because we work closely with uh, Callaghan Innovation um, and a program there to encourage investment into the earliest stage of deep tech ventures. Uh, so really proud to sort of wear that sticker and, and support that program. It's a fantastic thing. Um, just a little bit about us. Um, you know, in terms of WNT, you know, we see the need to empower um, deep tech uh, innovators and we think, we see that day to day, we see people with great ideas, with fantastic technologies, and a real passion for what they're doing. And what they really need is a, 
a champion and somebody who can get alongside them and support their ambition for growing a, a deep tech organization or a company and, um, and really help to bring a skill set alongside that. Um, and with that said, you know, we look at ourselves as a, what we would call a high conviction partner for founders. Um, we know that being a founder is a hard thing and it's often a lonely and challenging road. Um, and it's often a really long road um, to making things happen. I think Dan just uh, pointed at 20 years of R&D behind uh, his organisation. I think that's a, a quite a typical kind of story, a really long R&D cycle um, and a lot of development work before you even get out of the gate commercially. Um, so we recognise that and we recognise that once we get involved in these companies that um, but it's still a long road for us to return an investment. Um, and so we need to have a real conviction about our, our approach and what we're doing with those companies um, and a real kind of uh, desire to stick alongside them for the long term. Long um, WNT itself as a, an organisation um, emerged from a, a really collaborative uh, kind of partnership of several uh, very experienced entrepreneurs um, and, and capital providers. Um, and so we're sort of imbued with that entrepreneurial spirit right from the beginning. Um, and that's great because although we still want to keep uh, our accountants and lawyers and people like that happy, um, we're all in this to build exciting uh, new companies and to really change the world and change the direction of you know, of, of whole sectors. And I think um, that's what we all get out of bed for. Um, and so, you know, that heritage, having people behind us um, that really buy into that kind of vision for the organisation, I think is really powerful. Um, and you'll see on the right, just a, a smattering of the industries that we um, focus on or have, have some exposure to. So um, our model as a, a, an early stage venture firm um, is really more defined by the stage than it is by the sector. So in that um, collection of sectors and industries, you'll see a range of other things, not just the aerospace sector. Um, so we define ourselves as a generalist. Um, so we look at um, technologies across a range of sectors and applications. Um, we're really more defined by the stage that we get involved. Um, so we're quite often the uh, first outside capital into companies. Um, and often the sort of first financial investor um, to get involved alongside founders. Uh, and we look to get involved and, and support that pre-seed and seed stage um, of development uh, and really help companies get from uh, across that, that initial chasm, if you like. Um, as I mentioned, we really focus on deep technology. So that, and I, I think, I can't remember whether it was Daniel or Virginia talked about you know, um, diving deep and, and going in um, at that level. And that's very much our approach. That's what we do. Um, we look for you know, um, really transformative, early stage science-backed companies. Um, and we look to really support their evolution in that initial commercialization phase. Um, and we do that by providing not just financial resources and, and capital, um, but we really look to roll our sleeves up and, um, and get alongside founders, bring a bunch of advice and networks, guidance, support, tools, templates for things, um, connections to service providers, a range of those kinds of things. Um, and that's in line with our approach, which is very much about partnership. Um, and aspirationally, you know, we really want this deep tech sector um, to consistently rank among the fastest growing New Zealand sectors. And we indeed see that as a real opportunity to create huge value for the country, um, not just for individual companies or individuals, innovators, um, but collectively as an industry, I think there's a real opportunity here um, in the aerospace sector uh, underneath that as a, as a sector that really relies on um, a lot of deep tech innovation. Um, so just sort of touch a little bit on some of the way we view 
um, the technology and the sector and some of the challenges in it. Um, so uh, just kind of uh, put up a chart here that you'll see on the on the y axis there's a sort of specific technical advantage and insight. Um, and then on the x axis here we've got the size and accessibility of the market opportunity. Um, and what we what we're trying to balance here is to be able to get high on both of those um, measures. Because what we see is if the market opportunity is, is so specific and niche um, where the technology is being um, applied, then often there's just not enough customer base to justify the investment in order to access that market, particularly in a sector that often has a long development cycle and a, you know, a, a, a fair capital requirement. Um, Conversely, there may be a huge market opportunity, but if there's very, if it's really challenging to carve out a technical advantage and a, and a specific intellectual property advantage, then you, you can have get into that very competitive environment, which makes it really hard to cut through the noise and get real traction. Um, and so, what we are uh, what we're focused on at WNT Ventures and the deep technologies that we look to support are the ones that we feel have that advantage technically, but also have that sizable market opportunity. Because those, those are the ones that we see um, the opportunity for real significant growth in. And then we think quite carefully about how we protect that position. Can we um, create a sustainable um, technical advantage through intellectual property strategy, uh, through commercial arrangements, through you know, the, the way that we're looking after that technology and defending the, the position from others. Um, and then I'll note that in, in oversimplified generalistic terms, you know, re researchers tend to really like the pushing the technical boundaries and, and that's very necessary in the deep tech space. Um, commercial people also look for large markets and that's because for large um, returns to be generated, outsized generate, uh, returns to be generated, which is typically where uh, venture capital operates, um, then it needs to be a large market opportunity as well. So if we can marry those two things together, that I think is where, um, where the magic can really happen. And our general approach to building companies or, or supporting the building of companies here at WNT Ventures is we look at some critical building blocks um, that, build, that, that tend to drive solid commercial outcomes. And that's not just a technology that underpins the opportunity, but also high quality operators, you know, people who can really um, drive this thing forward people that have the, both the technical capability, commercial now, and the passion um, to really drive these sorts of uh, changes. Um, and we also need the, the capital, which is really the fuel for the commercialization engine. Um, and often I see companies look at you know, investors as the enemy, and um, you know, sure there are um, some that operate in the market that will try and take advantage of founders. Um, but we, what we see is that the capital is a, a necessary uh, fuel for the engine, and it's really about right-sizing the amount of capital and, and finding the right partners for that. Um, but then also, crucially, um, we often are looking at uh, where those first customers are, and ultimately where the customers are going to be for this business. Um, at the end of uh, at the end of the story here. So how are we going to access those customers? Why do they care about what we're doing as a company here? Um, and if we can bring these four key ingredients together, um, then we can really drive towards that initial commercially viable product, for want of a better term, um, as quickly and efficiently as possible, and really push um, towards that uptake. And what that really means is, you know, when I'm assessing new investment opportunities, we're looking for several different things. Um, we're very much looking for real problems. So we're looking for things that we can see as visible problems, and, but really importantly, things that are painful and, or, and solvable. 
Um, and we're looking for as much evidence of that as we can to give us an indication that there will be real value for customers in developing this solution. Um, so real problems is a really important starting point. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, big markets are important because there, there needs to be an ability to scale an organisation to justify the, the risk profile of investing at this stage. Um, and venture capital and what we're doing in the deep tech space tends to be at the higher end of the risk profile uh, curve. Uh, there's still a lot of technical risk as, as, well, as, as well as commercial risk. So that's where having a, a big target's important. And by big, I mean large in scale and numbers of customers and dollars, um, but also growing and global are really important. And we see in New Zealand, um, I think uh, uh, Virginia mentioned the, the size and scale of the New Zealand uh, space sector compared to the UK. You know, we're still a, a fraction of some of these other markets around the world. So we're looking for businesses that can really access a global market. Um, and, this, and in terms of big markets, we're, we may be talking about existing markets uh, that, that are uh, visible and, and that there are a, a range of competitors in already. Um, and we may be talking about a revolutionary product entering an existing market. Um, but equally, we may be talking about creating a whole new segment um, that didn't exist before. And both of those are really um, valuable potential opportunities. Uh, it's a, then it becomes a bit more tactical about how to access those. Um, and really thirdly, we're looking for revolutionary solutions. We're looking for things that are step changes, um, that, are both, that are protectable, like I mentioned around the IP, um, but also fit for purpose. So this typically means things and solutions that are more than just incremental, um, because what we're looking for are transformative opportunities. Um, that's where we think um, outsized returns exist. Uh, so those are some of the things we're looking at. And now when I step back, and I think both um, Virginia and Daniel's presentations actually did, did me quite a lot of favours there by, start, by uh, shaping the, uh, the background here and, and commenting on where venture capital fits in as well. Um, but when I look at the aerospace sector, I'm overlaying those, um, those decision-making points, those things I'm looking for. Where are the real problems? Where are the big markets? And where are the revolutionary solutions? So if I sort of zoom out on that, and I think Virginia had a much more elegant slide than this, but there's just a ton of components within that whole pie. Um, everything from guidance and navigation tools to engines and thrusters technologies to data processing and number crunching technologies to propulsion systems and everything in between. And so what I, when I'm approaching this, I'm looking at each of those parts and saying, where are we, where are we in this industry and where is this company going to be able to outperform um, its cohort of, of competitor companies, or which segment of the aerospace sector is going to outperform the whole. Um, and really, you know, who's, who and how will we win in each of those opportunities? So what uniqueness or what unique advantage does this company have in a unique sector that will, will enable them to, to generate that outsized performance? Um, and that's sort of we're looking for the above average as much as we can and trying to predict that as much as we can. Um, because those are the areas where the most value is going to be created, we think. Um, and often we're also overlaying on top of that, you know, where are the competitive tensions? So you know, I've looked at a, a number of launch vehicle companies uh, already out of New Zealand. Um, and that's not looking beyond New Zealand. Um, I've looked at a, a ton of kind of uh, data processing uh, technologies as well that are, that are really relevant in this space. Um, so part of part of what I see my job is is to try and um, identify pieces of this puzzle that I think uh, 
the most valuable, or potentially the most valuable, and then look for the ones that are most likely to win in each of those segments. Uh, and then construct a, a portfolio of companies on top of that that also takes advantage of that. So um, in, a, in a venture capital fund model, I don't want to have, or it doesn't make any sense for me risk profile wise, to have 10 launch vehicle companies in my, in my portfolio. Um, even if I think that's a really valuable um, segment, I'm gonna pick the best one or the one that I think is, is, has the most potential in that space. Um, but I may also couple that with um, thinking with some thinking that the aerospace sector is growing significantly and is a real sector of opportunity. So let's have some exposure at the, the hardware end um, of launch vehicles. Um, or let's and let's have some exposure to the data processing side or, or data exchange or communications technologies around that. Um, and let's have some exposure to um, you know, uh, companies that are going to take advantage of a changing regulatory environment. So it's about strategically us focusing on a segment like this and identifying the, the sub-segment areas that we think are really valuable and then picking the, trying to pick the, the, what we think is the most, um, most promising company within that. But as you can see, it's a, it's a really busy space. And that's just one segment. And so I guess the overarching question for us is where are the gaps now and where are they likely to be in the future? What trends are we seeing? What things are moving? Um, and how can we latch onto companies and support companies that are um, building really transformative solutions in the thick of those gaps? Because that's where we think there'll be outsized returns and that's where we think the most um, transformation of these industries will occur. Um, and so those are the ones that we want to target. And I think just stepping back, you know, also when I put um, put a New Zealand Inc. Um, hat on here, you know, and WNT very much operates a, uh, from a philosophy of a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, I do think that New Zealand has some really unique advantages in the aerospace sector. Um, some of which have been touched on already and I'm sure um, are going to be touched on in the next presentation as well. Um, but really I think there's, it's, it's sort of how can we leverage those skills and resources collectively um, so that when we are looking at that comparison of you know, the New Zealand space sector versus the UK space sector or, or any other, um, and at the moment it might be 7% revenue terms, or I think that was the number, Virginia, um, roughly speaking. How can we turn that from 7% to more like a 15%? How can we double that? How can we as a country outperform in this sector? And I think that's being quite strategic about the way we approach opportunities in this area, and then really coordinating and collaborating resources around those winners um, in that environment and really supporting um, a collective view of what that strategic direction is for the, for the country and for the sector. Um, and we at WNT would love that because you know, we also believe that you know, it takes a village to build startup companies and it takes a village often just to get them out of the gates. Um, and so we want to play our little part in that and we need a great a strong science and, and research segment. We need a strong commercialization capability. Um, we need a strong regulatory environment. And we need a strong kind of customer base for products in this area that are being built. And then we also need just uh, really brave, innovative um, people and people that are willing to give this a, a crack. And, um, we want to get behind those companies and those entrepreneurs and really participate in pushing this whole industry forward. So, um, so that's pretty much what I've got. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about anything that might be useful uh, in a month's time. Great. Thanks so much, John.
I think we do have a... We have a couple of well, yep. questions. Uh, I think I'll just sort of uh, combine this one from uh, Sam Tobin. Um, he was asking yeah. about uh, if there's a, if you're seeing a, a start of a critical mass in uh, in the space sector in, for investment, uh, like a, are there uh, startups spinning off of uh, universities or Rocket Lab, or do you see uh, New Zealand, other New Zealand uh, investors, venture capitalists, uh, in, uh, and active in this sector? Yeah, look, I think it's a really good question. And I think um, you know, Rocket Lab is a, is a beacon sort of example for New Zealand, a real pioneer in this space. And we very much are seeing kind of the fruits of that in terms of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So, you know, there are examples of ex-Rocket Lab um, early employees who have followed that journey a significant way through the uh, through the path and have now spun out their own technology companies. Um, you know, Holt is a good example of that. Um, a company now applying some of their smarts in the ag tech space. Um, you know, so that second wave of entrepreneurs um, is a really good, strong sign of you know, maturity of our um, ecosystem and levelling up a little bit. Um, and we're seeing a, a similar sort of thing in the investors on the investor side as well. You know, we've traditionally had a very strong uh, angel investment community, uh, and then we've, we've probably struggled to carry companies much further. So by the time you're getting into a Series A, Series B announced, we've just sort of run out of legs in terms of the depth of capital. Um, but what we are seeing much more of is, is smart syndication amongst New Zealand investors with offshore investors. Um, we're seeing um, more uh, investor dollars that have been uh, invested into companies early, recycled through a, a successful exit and, and then reinvested. Um, and it's that learning cycle that's, that's incredibly valuable in this ecosystem. And I think um, we're starting to see a maturity of the New Zealand system that, that hasn't been there. So I think the potential for us to um, do a multiple of what we have done in the past is really there um, right now. I'm really excited about sort of the stage of where, where New Zealand's at. And, and that applies in the aerospace sector as, as a number of other sectors. Great. Uh, thanks so much for the, that insight. Uh, I think we'll, we'll move on to our last speaker. Um, and uh, so our last speaker is Nick Brewer. Uh, Nick is a business innovation advisor for Callahan Innovation. Uh, he specializes in aerospace and marine sectors and also those uh, that are defense related. Uh, he's a professional chartered engineer with a degree in aeronautical engineering and design and an additional master's degree in business. Early career years were spent as an aircraft engineer in the Royal Navy in the United Kingdom before spending many years with the Air New Zealand business development and more recently with the University of Auckland as Director of Operations in Engineering. Uh, welcome, uh, Nick. Yeah, hello uh, everyone, good afternoon. Yeah, uh, Nick Brewer, Business Innovation Advisor for uh, Callahan Innovation. Um, and with me just sitting out of screenshot is uh, Zeus Engineer. He's one of our technical team of uh, researchers here. So when we get down to some of the technical problems, um, at least I've got a bit of cover here. So uh, I'll just try and um, share some uh, screen and some slides with you all. And where's that one? Yeah. How's it gone? Okay, how do you get? Uh... Yes, we see your screen. Okay, brilliant. All right, thanks very much. Okay, um, so yeah, Callahan Innovation, we are New Zealand's innovation agency. We are a government body and we are part of MBIE. And uh, I guess we have formed, uh, it must be around about eight years ago now, I guess, as the combination of what was the Ministry of Science and Innovation and the Industrial Research Labs. A lot of you will have heard of uh, IRL in the old days. So that was um, where we, we came together to become Callahan Innovation. And um, why Callahan? So um, here's the man himself, Sir Paul Callahan, and uh, a well-respected um, 
visionary scientist that was in, in government um, uh, years ago. He really um, put very succinctly uh, what most of us already knew was that uh, New Zealand was not going to progress um, by just focusing on the primary industries alone and sort of marginal improvements on that. You know, fish forestry um, really doesn't change that much. What we needed was uh, some, some good old uh, innovation. Um, so look, I guess for the younger members on the webinar, I, I thoroughly get it. You won't understand or won't know of Sir Paul Cowhan. Uh, we totally get it. So um, every year, you know, a whole bunch of you graduate from university and we have to go through a bit of education process for, for most of you. But um, that's where we came from. So just demystify all that. So here's the facts. This is what he recognised, is that back in, uh, well, our, our figures in 2016, that we as New Zealand only spent 0.6% of our GDP on R&D. Right, so compared to the average in the OECD of 1.6, which is a bit sobering, you think, well, that's, that's just an average number. You know, what are the good guys doing? Uh, Singapore, Israel, you know, way above five, and, uh, and we're down at 0.6. So uh, currently we've been set a target to, to get above the bar at around 2%. That's really um, our sort of driving reason for being. Uh, where are we? We are very predictably uh, Auckland Wellington Christchurch. The main, uh, the main uh, sort of CEO office, if you like, is in, uh, in Wellington. Um, the main business center tends to be in Auckland. Um, but around the country, we have uh, 15 sort of regional business partners. If you're in uh, Auckland, your business partner would be AT. If you're in Taranaki, it might be Venture Taranaki or, or, you know, and so on. So. Uh, that's just to, to give you an indication that wherever you are in the country, there's a, a, a place for going. We, we have links with those regional business partners. So what we, um, what we really need is that sort of um, uh, driver for change. We need a step change in innovation. Uh, business as usual really isn't going to get us there. The old Kiwi number eight, you know, she'll be right, mate is just not gonna work. Same old, same old, doesn't work. So, you know, we do absolutely have a, a mandate to, to drive innovation. And I guess what we could have is a great debate, perhaps on what innovation and R&D really mean. Uh, it's one of those great sort of cocktail party questions. If you, if you went into the party and um, said to one person, what does innovation mean? You could go around the whole room, I guess, and everyone would come up with a, a slightly different answer on it. So if you look at the key words there, um, we're looking at new, we're looking at significantly improved, we're looking at creating value. And on the R&D side, it's um, you know, creative and systematic and so on. So point to note here, we're Callahan Innovation. We are not Callahan Business Development and we're not Callahan R&D. R&D can lead to an innovation, but R&D on its own um, is, you know, it, it, it's a step only. So we're after the innovation, we're after the happening, we're after the end product or the end service. That's really, um, really where we're at. So, okay, so who do we work with? All right, so that's us in the middle there. And if we work clockwise from the top, yeah, we're, we're part of MBIE. They provide our funding and um, the, the support that we give companies is, is public money and they, they fund our wages and they fund all the development programs that we, we supply. Uh, we work with the innovation support providers such as the universities, um, uh, the Crown Research Institutes, Polytechnics and some private research organizations. We work with the industry bodies. Uh, for example, the, uh, the NZ Defence Industry Association is a very, very well organised industry body. Uh, UAV NZ, Aviation NZ, NZ Marine, um, most of those, are, in fact, all of those are non-government funded industry bodies. And we work with the incubators. We, we actually, right now, we share the same, same building as, uh, as the ICE House. Uh, we don't provide money to the incubators, but we do help provide um, some support for the operational of that. So. Callahan does actually fund a bit of the Ice House operational budget, um, but none of the investment money comes out of Callahan uh, for that through the incubator. 
And the regional bodies, we've already talked about the, um, you know, those, uh, those business partners and other government agencies like uh, NZ Train Enterprise are quite important to us. Quite often, we would get companies in the very early stage and uh, hopefully move them through um, uh, development in New Zealand. And as and when you get to the export stage, uh, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise um, hopefully sort of help, help take over that as well. So here's the uh, priority sectors that Callaghan has. Um, and you could read across um, all of those. I won't go through them all. But if you look down bottom right, um, on the bottom there, transport logistics. That's uh, the sector that I work in, and, um, and that's where the aerospace sector falls. So, you know, boats, planes, trains, anything that moves, and logistics, of course, um, that's, that's where we're at. Again, uh, logistics is probably the other question at a cocktail party you would ask, and you would get 50 different answers about what logistics really meant. Anyway, that's just to prove we have an absolute priority sector that does cover uh, aerospace. Okay, so moving on to the services, this is how we do it. Uh, we'll go through all these in uh, a little bit more detail later on, but in summary, we have, we have actual R&D services. We have a, a team at the Gracefield Innovation Quarter down in Wellington of about um, 200 scientists Yeah, down there. And we also have the R&D teams in Christchurch and a sizable one in, up in Auckland as well. Um, now, we also have innovation skills program uh, where we work with businesses to really up, upgrade their sort of business skills. We, we do find a lot of early starts very, very good in the, um, in the technical area. Um, how do you apply them into a business is, is quite, um, you know, it's a different thing. And, you know, we, we add our sort of experience over the top of that. Uh, grants, that well, I'm sure you'll all be interested in. We do grants from... Uh, early stage startups right through to uh, much larger companies um, you know, with, with sizable projects going into, into the millions. So again, we'll, we'll have a look at that. But the biggest value of all really is, um, is the advice. We have a, a whole team of advisors here that can take you through the stage of your business from go to woe and, um, and so on. T typically um, with uh, companies we we come across a situation where they're at a certain place in time, they know where they are now, they know where they want to get to, uh, but they're not quite sure how much of it they know already or some of the gaps in there they need to find out. So we would engage with them and run through an entire sort of um, business top to toe, uh, do a gap analysis and, um, and hopefully we would identify all those areas where we could either add value directly ourselves or them up to, to other experts um, that we know of. Okay, and I include this slide here because um, we often use this one to help sort of flush out where companies are and where we can add best support. So you see right from the left, it could be anything from a profit model through to the structure of the company, through the product, and uh, ultimately, your, your, your marketing and customer engagement at the end. So 10 types of innovation, we look at all 10. Your innovation doesn't necessarily have to be in the product, and quite often it won't be. And um, what we do find is that the biggest effect that we can have is normally at the front and right at the back, um, rather than bashing through the middle. Um, so that's uh, just a good explanation of, of where we fit. Okay, now we talked about the R&D, our in-house skills. We, we generally um, classify them into four main, four main areas. You can see there, advanced manufacturing, biotechnologies, advanced materials, IoT and data. And the next slide will go into those in a little bit more depth. Um, and I won't leave it on too long, but just so you can have a quick look, very quickly look at the area that you're in and probably something in there will be of use to you. So look, I'm not going to dwell on this one right now because um, I'm going to leave it up at the end. Okay, whilst we have questions at the end, we'll leave that one and you could perhaps uh, look through that and, um, and uh, come up with some questions if, if you like. But that's, uh, that's within our, our sort of armory there. 
Now we talked about some of those innovation skills, some of those business skills we look at. Uh, we run um, really about four main programs. Uh, most of you will be familiar with lean engineering. It, um, it stemmed from the aerospace industry. Um, building for speed is more sort of business, business process focused and um, it really lends itself to sort of software development type companies. Uh, driving innovation, uh, we look at ways to increase innovation uh, without necessarily, ne necessarily changing the whole product line. Um, quite often this is for more established companies who just need a bit of, bit of, sort of revitalization. Um, they've got a little bit stuck in the ways they do things and we just like to uh, give them a, you know, a, few, a few different ways of looking at things to, to get the innovation um, uh, pace up. And innovation IP, this is all about managing your IP and looking at the whole IP strategy. It's quite often people get stuck with the, uh, the patenting, uh, you know, fascinated with that. Quite often, it's not really about that. There's a hell of a lot more IP in what you do than just your patent. And you know, remember the first um, time you, you apply for a patent, you're, you're probably putting out to the rest of the world what you're actually doing. So quite often it's not the way to go. But um, you know, we do do programs on that and we, we combine um, our knowledge with those of some, some experts in the IP industry um, to set you up for a program on that. So which brings us on to the, to the grants. Okay, so grants are grants, they're not loans, they're not sort of um, uh, based on success of your product. Um, if you qualify for a grant, you generally don't give it back unless you've misused it. So we, we do have a number um, of different types of grants. We have a, I guess, a getting started grant, which is generally uh, run through your, your sort of local business body, if you like, your regional business, business partner. Um, that's up to around sort of 12K, um, which is 40% funded by us. So our sort of contribution to that is generally um, uh, around five. Um, but look, most of you in the aerospace business, you go, you're going to go well beyond that to begin with. What you're really looking at is the project grant. Um, and this could be you know, anything up to, or typically we get projects around the, the 200 to $800,000 range. Um, but they can expend, you know, extend up to several million. So how this works, okay, and I'm sure you'll be interested in this one. So all grants are by application. Um, you have to register with us um, to get logged into our portal. Uh, once you've got that, you can navigate to our grants section page and you can apply for a project grant. Um, this is where you have to explain exactly what you're doing, how you're going to do it, how you're going to fund your share of the project, um, why you're not going to go broke in the meantime, what's going to be the benefits, uh, what is your market strategy, your IP position, and so on. It's a bit like doing a massive dragon's den, except we don't take any stake in the company. Um, this is really about you proving to us that you're a good use of public money. So the general deal is um, it's a 40% rebate on your R&D only, okay? So it's not for your marketing expenses, your general business expenses, or your production. Once you get into manufacture, um, that's not R&D, that's manufacture. Uh, so we're in the early stages. Whilst you're getting uh, your, your product sorted through R&D, whatever you spend on it, if you qualify for a grant, um, you get a 40% rebate. And how this generally works is, is that as you spend a bit, you can get a bit back and people normally claim every quarter or so. Um, that's generally how it works. Uh, like I said, it's not, um, it's not based on an outcome. Uh, we're thoroughly aware that not all R&D succeeds. So, you know, hence in that upfront sort of diligence process that we put you through, um, we're, we're pretty strict on, on trying to make sure that you do succeed. Okay, now details on that project grant, they're on our website and they, they go into what I've just said in sort of more detail. So if you haven't had a good look at that, uh, you know, that's, that's your first go-to, have a look there. Uh, student grants, um, yeah, we've got three, three different types. We have uh, R&D experience type, which is generally um, short term, 10 weeks, you can get a student in their summer, you know, summer vacation from university, 
um, provided what you're what you're doing in R&D fits what they're studying at university um, you're likely to qualify and um, the way we look at it it's like well students have got a sort of 10 well at least a three month gap probably but a um, at least a 10 week window where they can work with you and um, you know instead of um, lying around not doing very much and costing the government money in some other way we would rather they be employed so it's a bit of a win-win they get experience in your company you get a student for free and um, and if they're any good you're highly likely to employ them at the end of it um, so watch out for those coming up they generally uh, applications for those generally start mid-year and go on till about um, uh, August time so we like to get everything in place um, before they all break up sort of end of October November time it's nice to know uh, that you've got got a position sorted um, fellowships now we're talking PhDs and masters again um, they they are fully funded by us if you qualify so if you as a company want to sponsor a PhD or a master's you can apply uh, to us and um, provided that what you're doing fits what they want to do and um, there's a you know gonna be a a good um, genuine it's an outcome in R&D at the end of it um, you know you again you're you're highly likely to qualify um, the issue with that you have to identify the student first and you have to have the university lined up as well it's a bit of a chicken and egg and it's a bit of work to do um, but it's well worth it especially for a PhD where you've got four years worth or at least three three and a half years worth of, um, of a free free student if you like you can pay them more if you like but the the um, the basic minimum is, is paid by us um, now once all your students have done their work um, there is actually a career grant available where um, students um, who've graduated and um, not on any other sort of form of grant uh, can uh, apply or you can apply um, for money for them to work for you for a period of time and it's meant to be a sort of um, uh, uh, try and uh, try and see if you kind of fit type grant so it's, it's not massive but it's enough to uh, to encourage people to, to at least um, continue to employ people straight from university so that's the sort of Callahan grants in a nutshell most of it's uh, available on the website and please have a look at that now the bit to note is that the the next bit there the RDTI so that's the R&D tax incentive from the government okay this is a tax rebate and it's through the IRD it is not through Callahan but um, it's really worth mentioning here to make sure that you all of you um, get this covered off so no matter what size of the company you are you're probably eligible for a tax rebate on the R&D that you do okay now that's something that if you are using accountants they should be all over it um, really that's a there's a lot of work for those people but you should be classifying all the work you do in R&D and actually uh, highlighting it and make sure that you can um, uh, download it pretty quick into um, a form where you can submit to the IRD um, for a rebate okay uh, we can't we can't advise on um, and that it really is a, a tax issue um, the extent of our advice really is is to say to you get in contact with your accountants and make sure they absolutely understand where you fit with that rebate okay so get in touch with us that's the best way is either through the website or on that number and there's um, probably you'll likely be uh, directed in the first instance to your regional partners and um, and then they will uh, contact the sort of main Callahan office if you like um, later on so that's about it now what I'm gonna do is literally just move on to that um, list of uh, um, services that we provide in the um, research and technical uh, side of our business so whilst you're sort of thinking of questions and so on uh, have a good have a good look at that lot yeah thanks so much about it. thanks so much nick uh, i know that we're kind of like running a little bit uh, behind time now um so 
I, I don't see any questions specifically at the moment, but I do want to, before we, we go into further questions, if there are any, I do want to acknowledge our, our sponsors for, for today. So uh, let me uh, indulge uh, you kind of like a little bit and just uh, to show here that uh, just wanted to, to make sure that we, uh, we thank all of our sponsors. Uh, Christchurch and Zed uh, specifically for allowing us to uh, be able to do this on a, on a Zoom platform uh, and then also Christchurch City Council who's uh, made the the studio here uh, in the Christchurch library available uh, for us to kind of like use for for the webinar. I also do want to uh, show you um, one video um, from our sponsors which is uh, just a, sh a short bit. Um, uh, for one second here. One of the things that I like to tell people about coming to do work here in New Zealand is you can actually get stuff done. The ease of doing business here is definitely a world leader. New Zealand is a nation of explorers. They've always been the logistics arm to Antarctica. And what better next step than to be also working towards space exploration for the future? Our project is Space Base, which is to help New Zealanders get involved with space projects. Everything started heating up about aerospace. The New Zealand Space Agency started Rocket Lab. And so it was the perfect time for us to come to New Zealand. There's a lot of companies that are supporting what is the new emerging space ecosystem, precision engineering to manufacturing to propulsion. The small scale of the government is actually a great advantage because they can rapidly make decisions. Their normal Kiwi attitude of risk takers and trying new things accelerated a lot of the things that we have done. How we can do it, not why we can't do it. Less red tape. An infectious enthusiasm and attitude that, that that's prevalent through the whole region, I think. All these projects in New Zealand are really uh, strongly grounded in the Maori culture and uh, we're uh, welcomed is a, a chance to pursue uh, high technology projects, but with a grounding. You're also so near to the outdoors. The lifestyle is just fantastic. This is a great incubating environment. If you demonstrate it here, you can take it to the world. Explore Ototai Christchurch. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for, for listening to that. And then again, as well, I would like to uh, thank our collaborators and our speakers for today, uh, the New Zealand Space Agency, Callahan Innovation, WNT Ventures, and Leo Labs. Um, and just for resources, uh, we're gonna be probably doing a lot more uh, programs like this. And so to keep up to date, uh, just go on our spacebase.co website. Um, also, if you are interested in learning more about news about space, uh, especially specifically for New Zealand, uh, do join us on Facebook. Uh, there's a group called spacebase.nz. Uh, uh, and then we also host a podcast uh, on, on space, uh, which is on spacebase.buzzsprout.com. And if you have any other questions on advising, mentorship, uh, consulting on the space uh, industry and technology, just give us a um, an email on info at spacebase.go. So um, I'm just gonna go back to, uh, to Nick um, and see if there's any questions uh, or any general questions. Um, we do have one from Sam. Um, uh, uh, Sam was asking about the comparison with the UK and U US where uh, there's actually large government funding like in the UK it's connected with uh, it has been connected with ESA and, uh, and the U.S. has lots of uh, government contracts. Uh, and so is there, uh, do you see any, any potential in the future in New Zealand uh, for actually increasing the scale of, of direct funding or support in, that, in this kind of area for space activity? 
Yeah, okay. Um, by coincidence, this morning um, before this meeting, um, we had the Defence Secretary visit and we had a great conversation around sort of future capability um, before the next sort of defence white paper comes up. And um, you know, the topic of using, using space far more to do what is currently done now by aircraft, say, or even drones, um, they were very keen to get a, a, a measure of, of what, the, so, you know, what the future would look like in this you know, scenario. So right now, I, I don't know of any particular extra funding available directly for this. Um, there would have to be a need identified through, uh, through the government, I guess the defense ministry for a particular something, uh, and then a challenge put out to industry to develop it. That was one, one scenario that we actually discussed this morning. So my, my suspicion is yes, there will be, um, but right now, probably not. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think they um, are actually def directly funding any other um, means to get there. Yeah. So Virginia? I know that. Well, Virginia may comment on oh, this. Oh, good. Yeah, just a um, more general comment there. I think um, so. As I mentioned, um, we are very much a new space nation, and the space sector here is driven almost entirely by commercial activity. And um, <clears throat> I think we see that as a real positive, actually and see our role as a space agency as facilitating and encouraging commercial activity. And um, there's plenty of momentum there, as you saw from um, some of the examples I brought out in my slides. So um, yeah, the emphasis for us, I think, is very much on the on encouraging and facilitating commercial activity. Mm. So I think before we close, there is one general question on the Q&A that maybe we can ask the, the entire panel. Um, Eric, you wanna? Oh. Well, I, I drew it, but it was it was really about ca supporting capacity building uh, and sort of uh, identifying a pathway for uh, all the way from students in New Zealand all the way into the space sector, and and so it's uh, and it and it sort of uh, uh, we've been talking about entrepreneur projects, uh, and it's a little bit of a challenge because the one part of the new space industry is that uh, you're you can uh, get an advantage if you can do things cheaper, which often means, you know, with small workforces. And whereas the, the, a lot of, for the economic development aspect in New Zealand, a lot of people are looking for jobs in, in, uh, in all these different sectors. Uh, and we had a related question for, uh, for Leo Labs about, you know, did the Kiwi space radar provide jobs ongoing in New Zealand or is it all, all an automated system, for example. So it's so so this. So I don't know if, if any of you have a, a perspective just on on sort of like the path uh, the uh, capacity building pathway for involving students all the way to working in the in the space sector, or or incentivizing or incentivizing, or are we all depending on on the entrepreneurs to create the new companies that will employ these people? Yeah, maybe. Got, can I jump in there, Eric? I think a um, couple of thoughts on my end. You know, we've seen the emergence of things like the regional research institutes, um, which I think are a great um, way to connect industry needs with research capabilities. Okay. Um, and they've been really focused on bringing in practical projects that provide both a kind of a, uh, a capacity building um, part to it as well as an industry outcome. We've also seen that in amongst a couple of the universities and CRIs where they're looking to engage um, real industry-led projects. Um, you know, there's been a, a series of activities around Waikato University here locally in Tauranga um, where they've taken a, they've created a, a kind of a program with um, students to engage in real problem solving with real local companies. And I think that provides a really interesting way for it to be a win-win. Um, I think the other aspect to this for me is about articulating the needs of the industry and, and creating a, a profile of how that matches up with what we're doing at the moment. Um, you know, interestingly, I spoke to um, a guy from KPMG recently. They've done a, a piece of work in the agriculture technology space. 
to say in Australia, talking about uh, the needs of the industry in uh, technology terms, um, and then overlaying uh, some data from the vocational training programs to show that something like less than five of five percent of those vocational training programs even had a technology component to them. So it was really identifying the mismatch um, to be able to inform the discussion about uh, what's needed going forward. So it was just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, can I I'll jump in here uh, just from the Auckland perspective? Um, we, we had some great debates with the University of Auckland um, about the need to, to breed the skills in the space sector. Uh, very conscious of the fact that there is no sort of dedicated aeronautical engineering or aerospace uh, degree uh, in New Zealand. Um, but what they're looking at is um, introducing a master's in aerospace. And uh, they're looking for our support for that, which we, we would endorse and we will write um, letters of support. Um, that's about what's happening up here, but we um, definitely need to see a, you know, a pipeline of, of students coming out with those kind of skills that you know, may or may not be available in New Zealand otherwise. Yeah, um, from the space agency perspective, we really recognise the need to have a pipeline of skilled people um, and that requires us to kind of really engage with people early on when they're young, inspire and encourage them. And we've got an outreach program um, designed to do just that really. So um, just a few examples of the things that we're involved in. Um, MB funds um, internships for New Zealand students to go and um, work at NASA um, over summer in America. Um, we're really involved in Tech Week, which is actually coming up in May. So that's um, a chance to highlight lots of the opportunities and exciting things that are going on um, in New Zealand in the space. Um, and then just another thing um, is the aerospace meetups that happen in Christchurch, also in Wellington now, but the Christchurch meetups um, are really big now, really well attended and a great forum for sharing ideas. And I think they're well attended by students and young people as well. Um, one thing to add from the Leo Labs perspective is the, there's a lot of interesting changes going on in the new space industry. And in fact, um, a lot of the data generated by the space industry is now available and can be accessed uh, by students. And so, for example, we've even had high school students and college students accessing data, generating applications based on the data. And I think that's true of a number of uh, space uh, satellite companies as well that may have imagery or interesting tracking data. So there's the opportunity to drive hackathons or student projects that might feed the, the front end of some of these uh, kind of STEM pipelines and, and ultimately produce a lot of engineers um, with, with really interesting skills and also the opportunity to connect space into other areas where it wasn't traditionally connected before. So um, outside of say aerospace engineering. Awesome. Yeah, well, great. Thanks so much uh, again, everybody, for your insights on capacity building. Uh, I know we've run out of time, so uh, thanks to our speakers. Uh, thanks to all of the uh, audience who uh, well, went online today to, to be part of this webinar, and uh, see you next time. So goodbye. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you.